Okay, good morning. Um, first, I have to admit, I was a skateboarder back then, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that, I, I think. So, um, anyway, um, so uh, how many of you wish you could do something you love and make a living at it? Right, some of you probably do it in here. Um, for the past probably roughly five years or so, I've gotten to go around the country and shoot different pic pictures of people that do this. And so I'm also one of the fortunate few that get to do that, uh, get to do this um, on a daily basis. I'm a commercial photographer. So over my career, I've done many different personal projects, photographic projects, and my latest one is the American Craftsman Project. Um, it kind of came from uh, some commercial jobs back in 2008 when the economy was kind of slow. And so we started looking for different companies that still handcraft beautiful products here in North Texas. So in 2009, we, um, we printed a self-promotion booklet and, uh, and uh, came up with uh, the feel of the project and got got really busy with some commercial work based on the same project and the style. So I'd like to show now, this is the original booklet. This booklet was the first six companies that we shot in the North Texas area. So at this point, I thought the project was kind of over and I'd move on to something else like I typically had. And so um, things just kept kind of pulling me back to it, various different things. And so the project began to evolve at first, it was kind of my own personal fascination with the, sh the subject, and probably from woodshop class in seventh grade, I did take woodshop, and I loved it. I made a lunch ramp because I was a skater. So, uh, um, you know, at first it was that, and then also my father was a big um, craftsman and all different things. Um, he could make almost anything. He could take anything apart. He could put anything back together. Even the presses that he worked on, the Heidelberg presses that he worked on, um, you know, in his printing shop. So, the focus of the project at, at that point in 2009 kind of changed because of the publishing of this book that we did, the self-promo piece. And I had a client and a friend of mine email me a really amazing email, and I'd like to read that now. A few months ago, I decided to start making custom leather belts. It was partly inspired by your work and knowing that you were inspired by your father um, reminds me that my work is inspired by my father as well. He has built furniture in his garage for the past 33 years, and now I go home to my leather work after my day job. Thought you'd enjoy looking at what I've been working on. And he sent me an Etsy link to his, uh, his belts online, leather belts online that he was selling them. So um, that was an, amaz an amazing email to me at the time. It really kind of made me think about the project in a really new way that I hadn't before. And so at that time I had dedicated the, the project to my late father, Landis Wilson Myers, who uh, would have really loved to see the development of this project, but passed away in 2007. So I kind of realized that the project could kind of inspire people to maybe do something in this kind of handcrafted arts. So I often say that the project is about functional art because Everything, you know, the majority of the items in the book are usable, but have an artistic quality to them. Um, when we were evaluating the companies, we kind of came up with this criteria that I think is interesting. The, each company or person had to be, this had to be their profession. They, not a hobby, so they had to make a living from it. And also, the product itself had to be something that people are emotionally connected to, something people love, like their hats and their belts. Um, Baseball gloves, you know, I'm a huge baseball guy, so um, baseball gloves, things like that. So the other third thing was diversification. I wanted to diversify the project both from the product itself um, and also the material that the product's made out of, so wood, leather, metal, that type of thing. And so also um, the diversi diversification also came in with the geographic locations of these different places. I wanted to try and represent different parts of the country. So just for fun, I put together a map to kind of show you where we went. I think it's interesting. You know, it's kind of distributed somewhat, you know, pretty well. We've got some stuff on both coasts, some things in the middle. Um, and, you know, the concentration probably mostly in Texas just because geographic location when we we're starting the project, it was closest. So. 
So we also searched for products that were um, indicative of that certain part of the country. So surfboards in California, skis in Colorado, accordions in Louisiana with Zydeco music, um, fedoras and hats in Chicago and also in New Mexico, more of a southwestern type of hat. So um, the project at this point kind of started to grow organically. It took about three years to get to the 30 companies and uh, shooting it myself, it was very gratifying to me to shoot it because you know, both personally and as a photographer, I get to spend time with these people that do this on a daily basis and see their wood shops and see um, what they do on a daily basis, see how they work. Um, even though I was with them only a day with most of them, I kind of felt a real connection with them and a real um, deep kind of genuine, you know, I wanted to make it as genuine as I could as far as our stories that we told. And the difficult part really came when the, the production of the book began for me personally. Above all, I wanted the book to be, um, to, be uh, to maintain the integrity of the project and the production value that we had kind of built online. So I also wanted the book to be really more about the stories or as much about the stories as it is about the imagery. I didn't want it to really just be a photographer's book. You know, I want to have some depth and have, uh, have these stories about these amazing people that I met. And I mean, there's so many of them. I could talk for probably a couple hours, you know, about it. But um, so I hired a, a great writer from Dallas, Eric Celeste, and he called and interviewed each company and wrote these short stories for the book. So we went into the production of the book, and I have to say it was everything I would hope it could have been. I mean, it grew from 250 pages in the beginning stages to 288, which it, origin, which it, is, which it ended up being. Uh, we printed it in, in Chicago, and, uh, and it was a real bucket list item for me as a, you know, as a, uh, as a professional. Um, and even I remember writing the goal down back in college 20 years ago, you know, I wanted to make a book, you know, a real book that sat on the shelf of Barnes and Noble and, and, uh, and had, you know, some real substance to it. So I think I, you know, I, I feel like I did that. So um, this is the cover of the book. And a lot of people ask me what I learned from all these different companies, and I say a lot. Um, you know, I, the most important thing I think I learned is that not everybody has to fit into the mold of what the American dream really kind of has become over the years, I feel like. These craftsmen live in a very different capacity than the average American. Um, they're, uh, they're not necessarily defined by monetary value, really. They realize that having something tangible every day to show for their work has value. And they often live in these small towns with low cost of living, but they make good money and they live at a, diff a very different, slower pace than many of us. Um, also, another thing I realize is that not all payments are necessarily financial and counted in dollars. Um, they work, their work enriches their lives and it creates or continues a family legacy. So now I'd like to show kind of a selection of a few of the companies, this is just a few because of our time constraints, but a uh, few of the companies that are in the book, and I'll kind of talk about them a little bit. So Chuck Lee Banjo is in Ovilla, Texas. He makes banjos. And what I love about Chuck Lee uh, is that he was a plumber for 25 years and wanted to find a retirement, you know, something else to do. And so he looked into getting banjo, you know, getting a banjo, and he wanted to kind of maybe make a banjo and looked into resources um, on how to learn how to do this. And, and it was hard to find that. So he was really mostly self-taught. He kind of worked on different things. He used, he actually used his retirement funds to, to really buy most of the tools in his shop. And so he makes these banjos, these beautiful banjos on a daily basis in his uh, shop there in Ovilla, Texas. And this was actually a um, garden and gun assignment, a commercial assignment. Some of them were assignments, and the bulk of them were just my own kind of fascination that I found with these different companies. Um, so let's see. The, uh, the next one is uh, Todd Johnson Pipes. He's in Nashville. And Todd kind of started how many people, I think, start making things. He. Uh, it started as a hobby for him. He made a couple for his friends, and he gave them to them. 
And then, um, and it just kind of slowly evolved like that. And people wanted to buy one, so he'd make one. And then he just, he started making them. And this is Briarwood, actually, that he makes the wood out of. He goes on an annual trip every year to Italy to buy the wood. And that's the wood that he uses to make these, these uh, custom pipes, smoking pipes. So this is kind of the process of how he makes them. He drills them out. And you, know, you can see the amazing texture in that wood you know, that he leaves part of it. It's almost like it's formed out of the, the wood. I mean, it's uh, very organic, I think. The thing that's really cool about him, though, is that I was there a couple months ago on a job in Nashville, and I met with him just to catch up with him um, because it's been a couple of years since I'd seen him. And now he's got a couple of guys working for him. He's got like four craftsmen working for him making more economical pipeline, um, smoking pipelines that he's starting to sell in stores called uh, Neptune and Icarus. And so it's just a little lower, more economical priced pipe, but he designs them and they make them there at his shop there in uh, Nashville. So Steinway Pianos is in New York. These are the forms that they wrap the wood around when they're making the body of the piano. It's a 160 year old company. And this is the forms inside of a really, in a drying room in order to remove all the moisture. There are 12,000 parts in a piano. It's pretty amazing, I think. They have just reached their 600,000th piano in their history. And they make them just outside of New York. This gentleman is stringing the piano. This gentleman is a kind of quality control guy. He'll tune the piano, make sure it works well and looks right before it goes out. Optimo Fine Hats is in Chicago and uh, Graham Thompson is the owner of that. And um, this is actually his hat that he made me when I was there, which I love that. Um, so one thing that I really like from the book is one of the quotes that he gave the writer when he talked to Eric, I guess, is that he's kind of self-described, he self-described himself as this, an old soul stuck in a young man's body. I feel the same way. And I guess that's why we kind of connected so wide um, and how I probably connected with most of these guys so well. Um, so he, that's Graham there, working on a hat. So now they have two locations. Another kind of exciting thing is since we photographed him, he is now uh, has a location, the manufacturing location, which is in South Chicago. And now he also has a retail, a retail location in downtown Chicago where you can go and get fitted and see the hats and everything. This is one of my favorite images from the book. It's a gutter jump image in the book, so it's good size, scale. It shows all the different hats. This is a Panama hat. He makes fedoras and Panama you know, hats out of different material, but this is a $25,000 hat. <laughs> Pretty amazing, right? And I went to touch it, like move it, and I, he told me that, and I'm like, okay, you can touch it, you can move it. So, but the weave on that is so amazingly tight, it looks like a material, but it's so tightly woven. Um, okay, so Nakona Baseball Gloves is in Nakona, Texas. They make baseball gloves there, and they have since 1934. Um, they, uh, they make their gloves out of several different materials, leather, kangaroo, leather, um, and also buffalo. I have several of them. My son uses one in his baseball. Just a great history, a great story to them. This is Betty when we were there. <laughs> I thought that's just like so perfectly poetic. She's like grandma making baseball gloves or something. I, love, I just loved it. And then next up, Oxford Clothes. They make men's suits in Chicago completely by hand. Always be faithful to quality. That's one of my favorite things I got to shoot as far as a saying like that. Um, these are the patterns. That's the pattern room where they have all the patterns from the different people that they've measured over the years. They hand cut all the material. They also uh, hand stitch each lapel. And each lapel has a thousand hand stitch on each side, which is pretty amazing. The ones that come down here, whoops. Um, I mean, a thousand hand stitches. It's just phenomenal, the handwork that these ladies do. One
One of my favorite ones was Carousel Works. They're in Mansfield, Ohio. And, uh, whoops. and Art Ritchie owns it. You can see their, um, this is their process. They were making uh, these large um, animals for, uh, for a children's hospital that day. I'm gonna speed up a little bit, catch up a little bit. And they start with this huge block that they laminate together and then they whittle it down and they measure. It's a very analog process. And they go from that little prototype frog to this prototype. So they just enlarge it up. But it's a very analog process. I was just fascinated by, it's not lasers and all that type of technology. It's a very analog process. And I guess obviously it works well for them. So he's making a snail. Tortoise, Let's speed up a little bit here. They hand paint everything. Manuel is, uh, he, he is the rhinestone Rembrandt. He is the most famous person probably in the book. And he uh, put Johnny Cash in black, made Elvis's jumpsuit. Been around a long time, icon in the the fashion industry and the entertainment industry, was making a Kid Rock shirt when I was there that day. Sta the Stagecoach Works, Jimmy Wilson acquired the business from his father-in-law, Jay Brown, and this is them together, and Jay Brown actually passed away a few years ago. Sorry, I'm going kind of fast. Um, and that's the interior of one of his coaches. It's just amazing, the beautiful handwork in there. North Bennett Street School is a school in Boston. They make, um, they craft craftsmen, I say. So they make jewelry, or they teach people how to make jewelry, different crafts, piano restoration, carpentry, cabinetry, violin making. And they started in the 1800s, late 1880s. Um, teaching immigrants coming over to America how to assimilate into the, the culture and get find work. So they, uh, they've been around a really long time, and that's a, it's a great school. I've gotten to know them pretty well over the last few years. This is from the book release party. I had nine craftsmen at the party back in November for the book release, and my stage, stagecoach guy brought a stagecoach for me, which was amazing. So he brought it. We stuck it in the design district of Dallas, and you wouldn't believe how many people drive by just like, you know, what in the world is a stagecoach doing in downtown Dallas? So um, I'd like to finish on a little story that I really like. In 2008, when the project had just kind of began, and it was a, begun, and it was a, just a kernel of an idea, I was walking out of a, 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 a hardware store with my son, and it was 2008, so my son was six years old. And we were walking my truck, and my son looked down, and he pointed at uh, this manhole cover down there. I, he, he noticed it and he said, hey, dad, look at this. And we looked down, it was a cast iron manhole cover and it said made in USA. And I thought, that's amazing that he noticed that at six, that he was just around me for the first few months that we were just kind of talking about it. It was not even really a project necessarily at that point. But he noticed that and pointed it out to me. And so it kind of got me thinking that, you know, the most important thing about the book is kind of the importance of continuing the discussion about what made in America means to all of us. Um, and also a further the appreciation of craftsmanship. And so one term I found early on that I really liked is consumer patriotism. And I always liked that because uh, consumer patriotism, it feels like something we can all do, you know? The government can't do very much because, you know, free trade, the global market, you know, they're not gonna put tariffs in and stuff. I mean, it's free trade. But we can, you know, as consumers, it's, you know, you can have consumer patriotism. We get to make the choice. So, you know, we purchase goods on a, from a global market. And so I hope that the book kind of makes people more aware of where their products are made. And when there's a choice, you know, consider the American-made option. Thanks for having me.